Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access their committee papers should please ensure that these are turned to silent. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking item, agenda item three in private. Are members agreed? Great. Um, our main item of business today is an evidence session with the Right Honourable David Mundell, MP, Secretary of State for Scotland uh, with the UK Government. Um, welcome to the meeting, Mr Mundell, and I understand you would like to make an opening statement. Yes, thank you, uh, convener. I'd like to just make a, sh a short uh, opening uh, statement. I'm pleased uh, to again be here uh, with this committee to discuss the ongoing negotiations of the UK's exit from the European uh, Union. I was last in front of this committee in uh, February of this year, and I think uh, one thing at least <clears throat> we'll be able to agree on that quite a lot's happened since then. At that uh, appearance, we discussed the Prime Minister's speech at Lancaster House and the 12 principles that will shape the government's approach and strategy to negotiations. We also discussed the Scottish Government's white paper on Scotland's place in Europe and the introduction of the European Union Notification of Withdrawal Bill. Since then, we've yet again seen significant developments, and I remain ambitious and positive about the UK and Scotland's future and these negotiations. Firstly, we've seen significant developments in the talks with the EU. Both sides have approached the talks with professionalism and a constructive spirit, and we should recognise what's been achieved to date. In particular, the Prime Minister has repeatedly emphasised that safeguarding the status of EU citizens in the UK and UK nationals in the EU is one of our first goals in negotiations. Through the citizens' rights negotiations, we've reached agreement on a range of issues with the Commission and are now within touching distance of a deal. For example, we already have complete agreement on the broad framework which will be used to grant residence, including who will be considered in scope. On key issues such as social security, we've reached agreement on the bulk of the areas. And on reciprocal health care, we have agreement on all aspects. The Prime Minister's recent speech in Florence also moved forward the negotiations with two important steps adding a new impetus on the financial settlement and the time-limited implementation period. At the latest European Council, the 27 member states responded by agreeing to start their preparations for moving negotiations on to trade and future relationships that we want to see. I believe that by approaching these negotiations in a constructive way, in a spirit of friendship and cooperation, the UK Government can and will deliver the best possible outcome that works for the whole of the UK. I'm confident we'll be able to negotiate a new, deep and special partnership between a sovereign United Kingdom and our friends in the European Union. Secondly, we've seen a positive collaboration between the UK government and the devolved administrations and devolved legislatures on the, e on the UK's exit from the EU. Close engagement with the Scottish government and the Scottish parliament has been and remains a top priority for me. One of the core principles of the negotiations is to strengthen the UK and deliver a deal that secures the specific interests of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. As the committee would expect, I'm working hard to ensure that Scotland gets the best possible deal from the process of EU exit and takes all opportunities available. There are signs of real progress, uh, for example, the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations was able uh, to meet again last month, and I uh, found that to be an extremely constructive meeting. Indeed, it was the very first meeting that ministerial colleagues from the UK Government and devolved administrations were able to note positive progress being made on the consideration of positive of uh, common frameworks and agreed principles that all underpin this work. Indeed, across all policy areas, the UK Government continues to work constructively with the Scottish Government at both ministerial and official levels. As well as being pleased to appear before you today, I'm glad that other ministerial colleagues of mine have been invited to appear before committees here at Holyrood. So I will appear again next week with my colleague Robin uh, Water Walker from the DEXU uh, Department at the Finance and Constitutional uh, committee uh, and uh, Robin will also appear uh, before the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee on the same day. I'll also meet members of the Justice Committee when they visit Westminster at the end of this month. And thirdly, 
It's, of course, vital that voices of Scottish business and other stakeholders are heard clearly in this debate. My colleague Lord Duncan and I, along with officials from the Department, travelled the length and breadth of Scotland listening to stakeholders in key sectors, feeding their views on EU exit directly to relevant departments to ensure Scotland's voice is heard and understood in Whitehall. We've prioritised engagement on EU exit with key sectors across Scotland, from farmers uh, in Shetland to tourism representatives on Sky, fishermen, Peterhead, financial services here in Edinburgh, soft pr fruit producers in Angus and distillers on Harris. This work is ongoing and with a series of activity lined up to ensure continued engagement with Scottish stakeholders, ensuring their concerns are recognised and acknowledged as we leave the EU. Convener, the UK's exit from the EU remains one of the most high-profile and engaging issues, and there remains much work ahead to deliver a smooth, orderly exit from the EU. I welcome the Committee's uh, continued contribution to this work and look forward to our discussion today and our continued engagement. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Uh, this week, in a letter to Baroness Verma, uh, the UK Minister for Exiting the EU listed 58 sectors which have been subject to government analysis on how they'll be affected by Brexit, and until now, they have remained secret. Last night in the House of Commons, um, a motion was passed that they should be shared um, with the House of Commons Brexit Committee. Will they be shared? The government uh, uh, I th had... I previously indicated uh, that uh, such assessments and analysis had, uh, had been made. The, the letter you referred to set out uh, the detail of which areas uh, they covered. And I think one, if I can just make one clarification because, um, in relation to some media reports that there was a Scotland-specific analysis. There is not a Scotland-specific analysis. There is, a, there is analysis of, of these sectors and as, as to how they apply within Scotland. Okay. The government is reflecting on uh, last night's uh, vote. Of course, the government respects uh, the decisions of Parliament and indeed the decisions of this Parliament. But on the other hand, the government has a duty to, uh, to act in the best interests of the United Kingdom and the government still believes that sharing all the information that is contained uh, in these uh, analyses would not uh, be in the best interests of the United Kingdom in terms of being able uh, to carry out these negotiations to achieve the best possible outcome. Thank you for clarifying uh, the Scotland-specific analysis that there isn't one, because the very strong impression was given when you appeared before the Scottish Affairs Committee that, that there was one and that you would share it. it w if it was an impression, uh, it wasn't one I intended uh, to give. I, what I said uh, at uh, that committee was that there was analysis which, impact, which, which uh, covered uh, uh, Scotland uh, that we had agreed at the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee on uh, EU negotiations that officials uh, between uh, the UK Government and the Scottish Government uh, would uh, engage in relation to the analysis that we had both done, because the Scottish Government, of course, has done uh, some of their own analysis in these and other areas. But it was agreed that officials would begin uh, discussions about uh, uh, sharing our respective analysis. Why isn't there a Scotland-specific analysis on the par with these 58 sectoral analysis? Because the, the analysis is in relation uh, to, sec to sectors that will uh, uh, be impacted on by uh, leaving uh, the EU. Obviously, many of these sectors are very prominent in Scotland, and therefore uh, Scotland's interests uh, in those sectors are part uh, of uh, the analysis, but the, the, these are these are a UK wide uh, these are a UK wide uh, analysis of, of, of important sectors. I have a, a copy of the FOI request um, to your department relating to uh, to the 58 uh, sectoral analysis that, that you mentioned. And in your response to that FOI, the Scotland Office say that they, they were involved in preparing these 58 pieces of analysis. Could you tell us which ones you were involved in preparing? I, I'm uh, not uh, going to... I um, respond in specifics to that, other than uh, to say that you would expect us 
uh, and want us, I would hope, uh, uh, to ensure that when this analysis was prepared, you know, Scotland's interest in these particular sectors and industries was fully represented in the work, and that's what we've sought to do. Have you, have you read any of them? I have, I have seen uh, some of uh, the analysis because obviously some of the analysis is much more relevant uh, to Scotland than others. There's 58 uh, uh, sectors, as you've uh, written, uh, sorry, as you've, uh, as, as you've alluded to, set out in, in uh, the letter. And th those sectors which have particular relevance to Scotland, then obviously I have taken a close interest in. So, can you give us any hint of what, for example, um, number two on agriculture, animal health, and food and drink? What does what does that say about the well, impact of Brexit in Scotland? I, I think we've just a, um, I, I've just set out that the government is going to respond to uh, to uh, the vote in the, the House of Commons uh, last night in terms of uh, what uh, it uh, what it says in relation to. Uh, these analyses, and but I'm not going. To, I'm not going to preempt uh, that because our position remains that putting these analyses into the public uh, domain would not uh, be beneficial to the interests of the UK as we take these negotiations forward. But do you not think that um, in order to make a proper analysis of whether Brexit is a good or bad thing, we should have access to all the information? I mean, for example, does the report that you say you've seen on agriculture, animal help and food and drink, does it say that Brexit is good or bad for Scotland in that area? The, well, I, I don't see that the, 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 the analysis is about uh, whether Brexit is good uh, or bad, a, dis a decision across the United Kingdom has been taken to leave the EU and we're preparing to leave the EU and negotiating to get the best possible deal. Now, I know and I respect that there are people who will think that that is per se a bad thing uh, and would, would wish that that was not uh, the case, but that's the basis on which we're proceeding. So what the analysis is about and what it backs up is our work to ensure that we get the best possible deal for Scotland and the rest of the UK. But when you're involved in these detailed negotiations, I don't think that it's beneficial that you disclose all uh, the information that you hold uh, in relation to your own position to the people on the other side of, of that negotiation. I think it's just, you know, I, I just think that is not the best way in which to uh, to achieve the best outcome. Well, there have been quite a lot of other analysis by independent academic organisations, most recently the LSE, which, unlike the UK government, has done a, a Scotland-specific analysis, and it showed that leaving without a deal would cost Scotland £30 billion. Does, does your analysis um, indicate that that's the case as well? I don't want to leave the EU without a deal, and therefore what our efforts are focused on is getting the best possible uh, deal. And, you know, I recognise all the reports uh, that appear in the media from all sorts of uh, sources which paint all sorts of very uh, dark uh, outcomes. But rather than uh, focus on a, um, the worst possible outcome, I think it's incumbent on the government uh, to seek uh, to achieve the best possible outcome and that's what I want to do and that's what I want to do uh, in conjunction uh, with the, the Scottish Government. I think if we need, we, we've reached a, a point, I think uh, in, in, your previous, in your meeting with uh, Mr Barney, he said the clock is ticking and the clock is ticking and that means that we all need to focus our efforts on the negotiations on getting the best outcome, not, not reflecting on what the worst possible uh, outcomes could be. I think some of your colleagues have argued for the worst possible outcome, but at that I'll hand over to my colleague Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Good morning, Secretary of State. I'd like to ask you a little bit <clears throat> this morning about the relationship between the policy process in relation to the negotiations with the European Union <clears throat> and in relation to uh, what the domestic consequences of that are, in, in particular around the EU withdrawal bill. Can you say a little about how 
the, the, the discussions you take forward on, on the one hand with Europe relate to what you're discussing on the other hand with colleagues and with uh, the devolved governments around uh, future uh, arrangements? Well, I, I, think that, I think that there has been a step change um, in you know, the working, uh, working between the UK government and a, um, the, both the Scottish government and a, the Welsh a, a Assembly government. I don't want to detain the committee with, with, the, dif, with the, the difficulties of, of the situation in Northern Ireland, but that has complicated uh, things, and particularly the operation of the Joint Ministerial Committee, because it's very difficult when you have two political representatives of governments present and one civil servant who's effectively had to represent the Northern Ireland executive. So, um, but we've, we've seen, a, I think, a major step change. I, I, and I put it on record, I think the involvement of Mr Swinney uh, in the process since June has been very uh, helpful. Mr Swinney is very experienced in terms of negotiations and discussions with the UK government, and I think he has uh, he, he has brought a certain order to the, to the process, uh, uh, which I, I, I have personally found very helpful. Um, I think so, and, and the basis on which we're proceeding is we recognise that there are areas where we we're not in agreement, and but we have those, you know, those are in uh, at one side, and then we can move on to discuss a whole range of other issues. So, for example, and I you know, acknowledge the Scottish Government have issues with uh, parts of the EU withdrawal bill, but rather than spend uh, the whole of our joint ministerial meeting discussing that, you know, we, we've, we had a very productive focus on how we would take forward uh, the work in relation to uh, the frameworks and those powers uh, which will be, which will uh, return to the United Kingdom and, and uh, here to the, to the Scottish Parliament. So we've, we, we've been able uh, to, to bring uh, that, that focus in the last meeting of the JMC. I think what we've also sought to do is by the various sort of position and policy papers which have been uh, produced uh, in relation to setting the uh, backdrop for the discussion in relation to the future relationship, then again, uh, th there's been extensive uh, enga en engagement on those, and that's ongoing. That's ongoing on a daily basis between officials in the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Now we've had some, you know, we've had some process issues, and I'm not going to uh, um, uh, suggest otherwise in terms of timing of getting things, uh, you know, getting things uh, um, between the governments. But gen <clears throat> generally, for example, in relation to these positioning papers, you know, the, 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 there's been a, a, a very good level of agreement actually in terms of what we would both want to get from from the next uh, stage. Uh, clearly, as we as we move uh, forward, um, there will be some very big policy decisions um, to be taken, uh, and those you know, the, but those will be the subject of parliamentary um, scrutiny and parliamentary debate. Because in addition, as I think you'll be aware, to the EU withdrawal bill, there are going to be a number of specific bills. There's going to be a fisheries bill, there's going to be an agricultural bill, there's going to be an immigration uh, bill, there's a customs bill, a trade bill. You know, all these will be subject to the usual uh, debate, discussion, parliamentary scrutiny. In terms of the, the way in which you're making policy within the UK government, there was an announcement a couple of days ago around cabinet committees dealing with Brexit, and I noted uh, that, for example, you're a member of the subcommittee dealing with domestic preparedness legislation and devolution, which is what one would expect. And I think you're also a member of the uh, uh, the overall uh, 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 committee for dealing with European Union and trade. Can you tell us how that f structure works from your point of view? How do you influence? Uh, or engage with your colleagues who are actually in the process of negotiations with the European Union? Well, I, I hope um, that the, the announcement of, of that change in that structure is actually is a recognition of, of that influence, in a sense, because I've you know, placed at the heart of um, discussion the need to work with devolved administrations, the need 
uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the devolved administrations, the Scottish Government, Welsh Assembly Government, etc., you know, played a full part uh, in the process. And, and this is, you know, this is. A, 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 almost a formal recognition of the importance that the devolved administrations will have in the next uh, uh, phase of the of leaving and uh, uh, as we move uh, out with the EU. So it, it it's making sure that issues that that reflect in relation to uh, the Scottish government in relation to the operation of a, um, many of the the devolved areas. Uh, is recognised at the heart of the at the heart of the process, and that's uh, you know that that's what we're looking uh, to do. Now we're not always uh, going to agree, uh, uh, and and we respect we, re we we acknowledge that. What we also respect is that the that the decisions in areas which are devolved are not ours, and the UK government It's not for the UK government to say. Uh, you know who should get health care in Scotland, or who should uh, access uh, further and higher education. But we want to work with the Scottish government, you know, to ensure that we have a coherent approach, even if we have uh, different approaches. Within that new structure, however, there is perhaps the most critical subcommittee is the European Union uh, uh, Strategy and Negotiations Committee subcommittee which is chaired by Theresa May, and I'm looking at the list of members here. Damien Green, Philip Hammond, Amber Rudd, Boris Johnson, David Davis, Liam Fox, Greg Clark, Michael Gove, Sir Michael Fallon, uh, but no David Mundell, and I wonder uh, how you uh, are able to influence the strategy of well, negotiations without a seat at that particular table. The, as, as you set out, that is a subcommittee of the Cabinet, and the way in which we approach all these matters is that they are decisions of the cabinet ultimately in relation to a, um, the strategy and approach. And I'm satisfied that I have the opportunity with direct access uh, to the prime minister and uh, other uh, ministers to be able to ensure that my uh, contribution to that uh, debate is heard and uh, hopefully is uh, acted upon. So one very practical example one of the things I know you will be discussing with Scottish ministers is future framework for fisheries, or indeed for agriculture. Uh, in terms of this negotiating committee, presumably they will, it, the subcommittee will be taking forward the work of identifying what uh, future arrangements the United Kingdom will have with the European Union in those policy areas. What I can update you on is that on Monday, Mr Ewing and indeed his um, counterparts from Wales uh, and um, a representative of Northern Ireland exactly, are going to meet with Mr Gove, Michael Gove, in order to actually discuss, begin, discuss, begin a discussion around what frameworks in relation to fisheries and agriculture might, uh, might look, at, look like. So, you know, in, in that direct departmental um, area, there will be, uh, you know, the, the, there will be a, a, a direct Scottish government, UK government policy discussion at, at, uh, at, 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 at that point. At that meeting or, or a member of your team? Uh, my uh, uh, Lord Duncan will be at a, uh, that so uh, meeting. With those, indeed, in, with those I, um, I am uh, committed to being uh, in Paisley in support of Paisley's City of Culture uh, uh, application, which I strongly support for the record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard Lockhead. Thank you. I find it astonishing that the Secretary of State for Scotland has not commissioned a Scottish-specific analysis of the impact of Brexit, especially now that you, I understand, have up to 70 staff working in the Scotland office. But notwithstanding that, let's talk about sectors, and there's the MSP for Speyside, where around half of Scotch whisky production takes place. Can you give us an insight to what the analysis of the Scotch whisky sector is in terms of the impact of Brexit, given the concerns over cheap imitations and the need for continuity of trade relations and agreements, etc.? Well, as I indicated you know, to the, the convener, I've set out what the government's position is in relation to 
uh, releasing uh, um, the, the details uh, of uh, the analysis. But what I, uh, what I uh, would say is that we absolutely and fully uh, acknowledge the importance of uh, the whisky industry. Uh, we are a, uh, absolutely clear on the need a, uh, to protect uh, the, um, the, the geographic uh, in indicators around a, uh, whisky products. Uh, we're clear on the need to uh, open uh, to continue existing markets and open new markets. But, uh, and I'm very heartened by the very positive approach that the Scotch Whisky Association and others take to the opportunities uh, that Brexit uh, could, uh, uh, could provide for them and the opportunities to actually grow uh, the industry. And if you, you look uh, at the comments that that industry you know, has made, they have been very positive in relation to opportunities. So that's what I'm... Uh, that's what I'm focused on. I'm focused on getting the best possible outcome for that, for that industry. Clearly, Scottish whisky is the biggest drink export for, for the UK and Scottish salmon is the biggest food export for the UK. Uh, and they're both Scottish sectors and two thirds of Scottish fishing opportunities uh, belong to sc Scottish waters as, uh, as well. That's why I'm astonished. Also, you're not in the subcommittee, where presumably that subcommittee will be discussing many of these really important industries of disproportionate importance to Scotland. The, I, I've indicated in, in my answer to, to Mr Macdonald how, uh, in terms of direct, uh, uh, direct interrelationship um, um, between the Scottish Government, involving the Scotland Office, and UK departments, these very important uh, industries' interests are being uh, represented and taken uh, forward. That, that's you know, it's, it's not just about what happens a, uh, at one a uh, subcommittee meeting. It's not a. Uh, it, it's about the, the overall approach, and the overall approach recognises the absolute importance of these industries and the importance of achieving the best possible outcome in these negotiations for those industries. My final line of question relates to the transition deal. There's a lot of debate over yeah. the negotiations for a transition deal. And Michael Gove, according to Lord Duncan, has said that uh, agriculture and fishing will not be part of any transition deal, suggesting, therefore, within a year or two, that full control over Scottish waters will be returned to the Scottish Parliament. What makes you believe that the other member states of Europe are going to allow the UK to cherry pick and allow transition for some areas, but turn around and say, but you can have our fishing quotas in 2019? What, do you, are you confident that agriculture and fishing can be separated from the rest of the issues of the transition deal, if there is one? I think uh, the, the position, as uh, Mr Gove uh, confirmed, is that uh, that the, the, there have been uh, no de uh, firm decisions in relation to uh, agriculture and fisheries during uh, the, the transition uh, period, uh, during the uh, transition period. So, therefore, you know, those are matters that are still uh, under uh, consideration. And, you know, there are, a, uh, for example, I, I was pleased, of course, that the Scottish Government uh, welcomed the, the, the transition period. I think it's very. Uh, uh, I think that that was very welcome. But the, the specifics of the transition period have not been uh, uh, agreed or fully uh, negotiated. So it would be wrong to suggest that they that they had or that there was you know an approach such as cherry picking was going to be uh, followed. That that is just not the case. Okay. My final question uh, relates to. The powers we've just discussed in terms of agriculture and fishing. There's enormous expectations, particularly amongst our fishing community, because every cloud has a silver lining, and even exiting the EU has a silver lining in terms of returning our fishing waters to Scottish control. And are you able to give a guarantee to this committee and to the fishing communities that perhaps in 2019, if the transition deal goes this, uh, uh, the way you'd like it, that 100% control of Scottish fishing grounds will be returned to the Scottish Parliament. What uh, um, I will say is we're in 
a, we're in the discussion now in relation to uh, what will happen in relation to the 111 uh, powers and responsibilities which uh, were on the uh, uh, list which uh, the um, Scottish Government sent to the Finance and Constitution uh, Committee. And I'm not going to uh, pre I'm not going to preempt the outcome of that th th that a uh, discussion. Uh, it, it's an ongoing uh, discussion, but I've set out previously that my principle is one of devolving. Uh, the, you know, I, I proceed on the basis of uh, a, a principle of uh, devolving, and that's you know that's the principle that would guide me. But there are there are detailed discussions to be had, and they are ongoing. So it's possible we will not have our waters returned to Scottish Parliament control? It's what's possible, uh, you know, is to construe every statement in the most negative possible uh, uh, way and present it uh, uh, in, in, in such a way. And, I, you know, I've been round that uh, course many times, Mr so that, Lockhead, that's in, ter <laughs> that's in terms... Yes, but I've... I, um, I've been round that course many times in relation, for example, to a, uh, the Scotland uh, Act 2016, when we were told that promises that had been made would not be delivered. They were delivered. The Scotland Act 2016 delivered the Smith Commission uh, in full. We have, I've been very clear that significant uh, powers and responsibilities will come to the Scottish Parliament as a result of leaving uh, the EU, and I am I am absolutely clear that that will be the case. Jackson Carlow. Good morning, uh, Secretary of State. Um, you alluded in uh, your opening remarks to the outcome of the most recent European Council, where the uh, 27 agreed to begin preparations on their position to allow uh, trade talks to proceed in the event that sufficient progress is deemed to have been made by the December Council. Um, sufficient progress, of course, uh, is a determination on issues relating to citizens' rights and to Northern Ireland, about which uh, governments and many people in this Parliament have had a great deal to say. But it also, of course, will uh, concern the progress being made on the divorce bill, and you alluded to the Prime Minister's st uh, statement in relation to that. Uh, I'm unclear, and I wonder if you're any clearer, of the position of the other political parties at Westminster on what they regard an acceptable divorce bill to be. Uh, have you, as Secretary of State, had any intimation uh, from political parties who have a great deal to say on so many different aspects of the negotiation that's underway, what they regard as an acceptable divorce bill? And insofar as you have had indications from them, do you find those to be credible and acceptable? I haven't, <laughs> is the answer. I haven't had any such representations. So uh, on that, because it did seem when we were in Brussels that there was a, an agreement that considerable progress was being made on the issue of Northern Ireland, on the issue of citizens' rights, although there was still some more to be had, and that the budget was going to be an absolutely critical factor in the determination of sufficient progress. I mean, Do you place the budget and the importance of uh, an agreement in principle around how that will progress as being the issue in which you know a great deal of um, you know position support around the government's position ultimately will need to be achieved a negotiation has two parties uh, or, or if you know in this case we could say 28 parties plus the commission plus european par european parliament so we can't assert you know what what either the process is or uh, how it uh, how it unfolds or the relative importance that's placed on you know different issues and we've we've acknowledged that uh, we wouldn't have always proceeded on the basis uh, uh, that uh, has been uh, has been the actual um, outcome but your, your more general point is is correct and it goes back to something I, I said earlier you know we are a key point in this negotiation and i think that it would be much better for the country as a whole united kingdom scotland that we did all pull together in relation to the negotiations and uh, try to get the best possible uh, deal not to seek uh, political objectives not seek to defeat uh, the government simply because that was 
possible uh, on the basis of parliamentary uh, numbers, but actually to rally round and try and get uh, that best possible deal, because it's clear to me that all the other countries involved you know, will be significantly pursuing their own interests. We need to pursue our own interests, and we need to do it in as a united and uh, cohesive way as we possibly can. Yeah. I've only one other question, that's relation to the, um, the 111 uh, powers as identified, uh, in which I know there have been uh, sustained and ongoing engagement with the Scottish Government. Uh, I know that Mr Green has been involved in these conversations as well in relation to how these matters will proceed. Um, as I understand it, you've said either these powers will be the subject of uh, a transfer to the Scottish Parliament or to framework agreements in which the Scottish Government will have had its uh, party of agreement too. Do you regard that as a significant way in which to uh, develop these matters and to arrive at a final agreement? What I've said and what I said recently at the Scottish Affairs Select Committee in uh, Westminster is what I would like is very quickly to get to a point where in relation to the list, and 111 is a bit an arbitrary number because some of these uh, some of these powers contain a, a whole range of things. I, uh, I, so it, it's a little bit of an arbitrary number. But basically, I would like us very quickly to get to a situation where there is a, a series of powers and responsibilities. Everyone agrees comes to the Scottish Parliament as soon as practical. There's a second area where everyone agrees that a framework is necessary. And the Scottish Government you know, acknowledge that there are areas where there will be frameworks necessary. And at this stage, you know, there's an area where there's some continued discussion. But I think that it would be extremely helpful to the process, extremely helpful to giving a, uh, a Mr Lockhead and others confidence in our uh, approach uh, that we were able to, to achieve that. And I hope that that, that can be forthcoming uh, relatively shortly. There's something ongoing at the moment which is called a deep dive. Uh, which is where officials uh, from both governments are working on th uh, on two areas, a, um, a, a, a the justice and agriculture, to look at what frameworks might look like and what all the sort of technical uh, areas, uh, and that's ongoing at the moment. The, the, there's a third area of, of health that's being looked at because Obviously, Wales doesn't have its own justice system, so they um, are, you know, um, are separate from uh, uh, England. So it, uh, that work is ongoing you know, at the moment. But you know, I, I want to see that expedited. I want to see us in a position you know, where a, um, we, we are able to set out uh, in detail what is good, what what will happen in relation to these these various areas? Okay. And sorry, convener, because I think it's just important uh, uh, for, uh, where there is a framework that a UK framework that does not mean that the UK government imposes a position on a uh, the, uh, the the respective uh, administrations in in the United Kingdom. It means that there is an agreement on what. Uh, arrangements should apply across the United Kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Gujan. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's just a quick supplementary point I want to, to raise in relation to Richard Lockhead's question. He touched on the transition period. And I was just wondering, will, in terms of a trans transition period, if that is agreed, would the UK government continue to contribute to the EU budget during that time? And also, if would it be correct in saying then that if that trans again, if that transition period is agreed, that this the UK government, the UK would still be subject to all the rules and regulations of the EU, but would have no political representation or any influence in the decision making during that time. Um, I'd caveat with what I would, what I would, you know, the response with obviously that hasn't been, you know, the transition period hasn't been agreed, but the intention as. Uh, David Davis has, has uh, set out when he appeared um, before the, the DEXU committee in the House of Commons was that as much as possible would, would stay the same because what um, the feedback from business and other stakeholders is that they want, they want really just one point of change. They don't want to have to go through a change at the, uh, in, in March 2019 when we entered the transition period and another change as we left the transition period. So the intention 
uh, or, or wish that we would want in relation to the transition period is that everything would be uh, as uh, uh, as much uh, um, as is possible uh, equivalent uh, to the arrangements that exist. Now, of course, there are, there are some complexities. I, um, Mr. Lockhead alluded to one in relation to the common fisheries policy, the common agricultural uh, policy. When you're, you're um, effectively have left the EU and those, those issues will have to be um, those issues have to be uh, resolved um, the Prime Minister has made uh, you know the government has made um, a, 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 a clear um, statement in relation to uh, uh, the funding a uh, position which would con which uh, would uh, continue in that a uh, in that period as part of the uh, overall arrangements for, as we would see it, meeting all our obligations uh, as we leave. Those important decisions that you touched on there, like agriculture and fisheries, we would have no political representation in saying we will, how those decisions are made. Well, it, we will not be we will not be a member state of of the EU, and that is the consequence of the outcome of of the referendum, and that that is. Uh, a fact, but of course, it would be that would be the same position if we were um, in EFTA or EEA arrangements. That's that's the basis on which uh, they proceed. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I really want to touch on uh, focus on EU citizens, though. Uh, in your opening statement, you said that the UK is in touching distance of a deal with the EU on citizens' rights. However, would it not be fair to say that there are still substantial hurdles to be overcome in that, in relation to the rights of extended family and in terms of the role of the European Court of Justice in upholding uh, citizens' rights? And how do you see those hurdles being overcome? I think that uh, the the level of um, agreement that we've managed uh, to reach gives us um, a hope uh, that that the, that the outstanding issues uh, can uh, be resolved. I think we, I mean I think we have come uh, a very uh, significant uh, distance. We want you know we want to make sure that we that uh, uh, EU citizens. Uh, can uh, remain in the United Kingdom. The Prime Minister has always set out her uh, the, the value, importance, the welcome that she uh, has uh, in respect of EU citizens. Uh, so we want to be able uh, to conclude those arrangements. Of course, as we've set out previously, uh, we want uh, to be able to uh, we want to be able to ensure. Um, that UK citizens who are uh, resident in uh, other parts of the EU also have uh, e equivalent uh, rights. But I, I, am, I am confident that we are that you know, in that area uh, we are going to be able to get a resolution. I think it's all very well that the Prime Minister welcomes EU citizens and has offered those those platitudes, but essentially I feel like that's what that's all that they are because it isn't very reassuring to the EU citizens living in this country when they really don't know what's going on. And in terms of uh, a no deal scenario. Now, I understand this may be something you don't want to see happen, but in the committee, the Scottish Affairs Committee last week, you said that we understand the need to prepare for a no deal scenario. That is the responsible thing to do. What does a no deal scenario look like for the EU citizens living in this country and indeed for the UK citizens living in the EU? A, a no deal um, scenario is, is a, in my view, I know where we effectively leave the EU on uh, WTO terms, but uh, that various other agreements have been put in place. So although that is characterised as no deal, it is effectively a minimalist deal. And I would anticipate that if even if we left on the basis of a minimalist deal, we would uh, fully implement the arrangements that have already been negotiated and are close to being finalised in relation to EU citizens. We want EU citizens uh, to be able to remain in the United Kingdom. We want UK citizens to be able to remain in the EU. There are just a couple of other points that I feel are really important and, and, and need to be discussed. Uh, in terms of settled status, now, uh, we were told in evidence to this committee that there's a legal uncertainty around that term and it's particularly problematic because of the uncertainty that it gives for landlords, employers and indeed the NHS in terms of how they will treat people. So are you able to tell us exactly what settled status 
will mean and how will that compare to the current rights that EU citizens have uh, living in this country? What I'll uh, do because of the uh, of, of, of because these are, these are complex issues, I will write specifically to the, the committee on um, the settled uh, status issue. But basically, uh, anyone who has anyone who has a, been in the UK for five years at a date which it, which will be the subject of negotiation will be able to uh, achieve. Uh, settled status. If, I, um, the, if, they, if they haven't achieved the five years, they will be able to remain for the remaining period, part of the five-year period uh, to, uh, to uh, reach that point. But uh, I do recognise you know, the complexity of the issue uh, and the points you raise, and I'll write, I'll write to the committee you know, in greater detail uh, on that. Thank you. I, I do appreciate that, but to be honest, it's all very well writing to the committee, but we're not the ones who need to be informed about what's happening, because I think that it's the uncertainty for the people, the EU citizens living here, that they really need to know uh, what's going on. And that would lead me on to communication as well. What is the communication strategy in terms of informing EU citizens of the most up-to-date information that, that's happening with EU negotiations and about what their future status might be. We took evidence from uh, EU citizens to this committee. Uh, they told us that they're dependent on newspaper reports, having to check things online with no, nothing in terms of direct communication. So how is that going to be handled from here on in? The, there, is a, there is a very specific um, online a, um, a, a, a op opportunity to, um, uh, to, to get the maximum possible information, and I, I will... I, um, I, I will um, share that uh, with the committee. I accept that that needs uh, to be uh, widely promulgated. You know, I understand the concerns that people have had during this. It, it, it is an uncertain period, and you know, I, I absolutely uh, understand that. But that's why we want to uh, resolve it as quickly uh, as possible to bring as much. Uh, certainty uh, as was possible. I, I would have, I would have preferred that we had actually, you know, been able to uh, negotiate this immediately. Uh, that Article 50 was triggered, but the, the EU didn't want to proceed on that basis um, at that time. But you're absolutely right. It's incumbent on us to get as much information to people uh, as uh, we possibly can. I, I think there is always. A, uh, it, 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 and, and there are always you know, different opportunities uh, and ways to doing that. But the, the, the website, which I'll provide details of, is, is very, very compre comprehensive. To be honest, though, I, I don't really think that's acceptable in terms of that's something that people have to actively go out and try to find rather than direct communication. And just one final point that I think is vitally important to raise is in terms of discrimination. We heard direct evidence here that people are actively being discriminated against in terms of applying for jobs, in terms of applying for mortgages and getting other uh, and applying for homes. And uh, as well as that, we heard uh, there were reports in the press last week about the increase in uh, exploitation by unscrupulous employers who are taking advantage of the uncertainty over Brexit and what that's doing in terms of trafficking and slavery. So in terms of all those issues, what work is being undertaken by the UK government? How aware are you of the problems there? And specifically, what actions are being taken to tackle that? We are we are aware that, that and you know the, the evidence that you took was an important you know a, a, important uh, validation of uh, that these issues are that under way are, are, are taking uh, place. I mean, obviously, we do have both within Scotland and in the UK comprehensive uh, discrimination anti-discrimination uh, legislation, and that uh, uh, you know that in itself should be. Uh, utilised where these cases uh, come to a uh, uh, come to a for, come to the fore. We've got very comprehensive both here in the, in, in Scotland and uh, UK anti-slavery um, and a real uh, determination. I think in relation with both governments not to tolerate in any way uh, modern. A, uh, slavery or trafficking, and we must utilise, uh, you know, those laws and means. And anybody who's got any information about that happening, uh, you know, needs to get that uh, to the police. It's not it's not acceptable. But we need to 
you know, we do also need to, uh, in relation to the, the discrimination that you mentioned in relation to, uh, you know, financial arrangements and uh, mortgages, uh, mortgages and housing, you know, we, we, t we take that very seriously and are looking at what additional measures uh, could be taken in addition to the, the con comprehensive arrangements that are in place. Thing proactively being done at the moment because I understand what you say about the legislation being there to tackle that, but it's all very well looking at it now. But you know, this is it's been ongoing for a while, it's continuing to happen, and I think that people need to be reassured that the government is proactively looking at ways to tackle this, and it's those proactive actions that we'd be looking at. Well, well the, I mean, about. there's a lot of proactive action uh, going ahead in relation to the modern slavery and trafficking uh, front, for example, uh, you know, on, on that uh, specific. But you know, I'm making it very clear, uh, as, as I possibly can, that that's the sort of discrimination that, that you uh, mentioned in your run is just not, you know, is not acceptable. It's not acceptable here in Scotland. It's not acceptable anywhere in the UK. If uh, we have comprehensive you know, array, uh, discrimination uh, uh, laws within uh, both Scotland and the UK, but if they're not adequate, then uh, further, something further would need to be done. Thank you. Uh, Tavish Scott. Thank you. Uh, Secretary of State, will the uh, final deal, whatever form that uh, takes, be subject to a vote in the House of Commons before the 30th of March 2019? It's my understanding that it will. It is our intention that it will. It's our intention that it will take place before the vote in the European Parliament. Thank you. Um, the other questions I had were just supplementaries to some of the questions around fisheries. Um, I wasn't clear about the point you were making on fisheries and agriculture in transition. Uh, will the current regimes that we all understand and love or hate, common fisheries policy and common agriculture policy, continue as they currently are uh, delivered during that transition period? A final decision has not been taken in relation to, to, to those matters because the transition arrangements have not been fully, uh, negoti fully negotiated. So it would be, uh, I couldn't give you at this moment a definitive position. Now, the, the position, uh, and I, I don't think it's a, a breach of confidence, I mean, the position, for example, of the Scottish Government is that they would wish for both of those arrangements to continue uh, during, the, during the transition uh, period. Uh, my understanding is that the NF uh, US in Scotland would wish uh, the, the cap uh, position to continue during the transition, uh, but that the Scottish Fishermen's Federation would not wish for the common fisheries policy to proceed during the transition. So obviously, you know, there, there, there are, there are uh, discussions to be had and, and uh, you know, decisions ultimately to be made. But then it, I can't, it, there isn't a definitive uh, response at this moment. No, I understand that. But you've said what the Scottish Government's position is, but what's the UK Government's position on both the common agricultural policy and the common fisheries policy during the transition? Do, do, is the UK Government's position that those policies should continue during the transition as they currently work? Uh, our, um, our position is, as I've set out, that we have... We, we are still uh, uh, engaging in relation to both of those, uh, both of those issues, uh, we'll, and I've set out what, you know, what that engagement has brought f uh, forward in relation to Scotland. And there's a meeting on Monday, I think you said earlier on. Is that a meeting to discuss uh, this transition? Uh, it, it's a me no, it's, uh, it's, it, it's about frameworks. It's a yeah. meeting of, uh, I think it's, I think, uh, um, uh, Mr. Lockett may previously have been part of it. Uh, it was called a quad, yeah, yeah. Uh, which seems to be the t uh, a so very popular term really these days, really uh, where the, the three devolved administrations and DEFRA come together. Uh, but Mr. Gove's intention is to that, that that meeting would be the beginning of a, of a, of a discussion okay. around frameworks. And could you just clarify when the devolved administrations of the United Kingdom will be involved in the discussions over, this, over the transition period as it affects agriculture and fisheries? Is that part of the well? I I, I, I I would imagine that the transition period would be discussed at the next meeting of the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee on uh, European Negotiations, uh, which is scheduled in in the next uh, few weeks. Okay, thank you. The final question I had was on the uh, uh, on No Deal. Um, to take your point that obviously you're not seeking No Deal, but no, no Deal is clearly one of the things that could happen. Has the no, has the, all these um, uh, sectoral analysis that you were being asked about earlier on included an assessment of what would happen to every part of the UK economy uh, if there was no deal or a minimalist deal? I think to use your phrase. 
I think that if I were, I, I, I mean, I think the the, the analysis um, are not a, they're not uniform because there are different a, there are di there are different elements to a um, the different a analysis. So it it, it uh, wouldn't be possible to say that all analysis con uh, uh, contained uh, are, are a reflection of all scenarios. But the, but the scenario where there is a minimalist deal to, is, is clearly one that is the easiest in some ways to define. Well, there, there are, a, the, well, for example, a, it, it is possible in relation to each of these areas to determine what WTO sure. terms are uh, for, for the area. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ross Creer. I mean, uh, one brief supplementary on Marie-Goujon's point before moving on. <coughs> the evidence session that the committee took with European citizens has been mentioned. One of the witnesses that we had, a, a woman from Romania who's uh, here with her, her family, husband and, and two young sons, said that she felt like she, uh, other European citizens, her family, had been treated like the dog that the UK had bought for Christmas but didn't want anymore. Given the level of uncertainty that this 180,000 people in Scotland, 3 million across the UK, have had to face over the last year, more than a year, do you believe the UK government owes them an apology for having put them in that situation? I don't, uh, um, I, I don't think that uh, to be the case. I'm obviously always concerned you know, to hear about uh, uh, people who feel uh, that they have been uh, badly a, uh, treated or the, the personal uh, experiences uh, that uh, they had. But I think what the government has made it clear throughout that it was a priority to, to resolve this issue. And it's been pretty clear uh, throughout you know, that we wished people to stay. And we've, we've sought uh, to convey a, uh, from the Prime Minister, myself, other members of the government, that we wanted people who were here to stay, to be able uh, to stay, but that it was very important in the discussions to ensure that also UK citizens who were living in other parts of the EU would, were able to stay there as well. The government prioritised this within negotiations, you're correct, but you could, of course, simply removed it from negotiations and taken unilateral you know, action to reassure people. But moving on to the, the form of the deal, your Cabinet colleague, uh, Liam Fox, said either yesterday or this morning that he is not afraid of a no-deal Brexit scenario. Are you afraid of a no-deal scenario? What uh, we are in um, is um, a negotiation to try and achieve the best possible deal. We are not seeking no deal, but we have to plan for there being uh, a no deal. It, uh, and that, that's basically a, um, where we are. We, I, mean, I, I, I don't think that a, by characterising a no deal scenario as cataclysmic and uh, you know is it, is a helpful way of, of of taking that forward in terms of getting a good deal because that's what that's what we want to do so therefore you know the reality is yes if we are not able to get a deal we will be in a no deal scenario and we will we will look to manage that we will look uh, to get the best possible outcome from a no deal scenario as I uh, said, and I think Mr. Mr. Scott characterised, I mean, a no-deal scenario is essentially a minimalist scenario. It's not, as a sometimes is portrayed, that we sort of crashed out of the EU. It's just that we, are le we would be leaving the EU on WTO terms and on the basis of certain specific agreements. The projections that this committee commissioned from the Fraser Valander Institute for the minimalist deal, no deal, that, that range of scenarios, uh, projected that Scotland would be set to lose 80,000 jobs and that the average wage would drop by £2,000. You see, it's not helpful to characterise this negatively, but this is simply economic analysis. There was no political spin on that. Surely work, workers in Scotland would be concerned, would be afraid of a £2,000 drop in average wages. Why are you, as their Secretary of State, not also concerned and afraid of that? I'm attempting, I think as I've set out, to ensure that we don't leave the EU on a no-deal basis because uh, I... Um, to leave the EU on a no-deal basis, if that's the deal that was presented, would you as a Scottish MP be willing to vote for that in the end? What a, uh, I've said a, and, and made clear today is the United Kingdom has voted to leave the EU. 
what it is incumbent on the UK to do, UK government to do, working in conjunction with the Scottish government and others, is to get the best possible deal. And that's what I, you know, that's what I want to focus on, not on all sorts of a uh, negative uh, uh, scenarios when those are not what's currently in play. I am confident that we will be able. If negative to, scenarios I am, I'm are confident in play, that then we'll have be you able taken to, no deal off the table. I, I, we have to prepare for no deal. It would be a no deal scenario. It would be irresponsible of the government not to prepare uh, for a no deal scenario, but it is not what we're seeking to achieve. What we're seeking to achieve is the new economic partnership with the EU, which the Prime Minister uh, has, uh, uh, has set out, which we hope uh, we can begin negotiating uh, after the December Council. That's where we're putting a, uh, our a uh, focus it now you know it's not it's clear there are some people who who would ar who, who do argue for a no deal just as there's some people who argue that we should be taken back you know that we should abandon brexit and remain uh, in a uh, in in the eu and you know people have their reasons for for arguing a uh, uh, both and, and, and other scenarios but what the government's about the uk government about is getting the best possible deal and that's what our fo that's what our focus is on that's what our focus is on in relation to uh, the the shape of this uh, future economic partnership which we want to achieve you mentioned, I think it was in your opening remarks, the respect that you and the UK government have for this parliament. Last week in this parliament, we voted overwhelmingly to call for a no-deal scenario to be ruled out. What's your response to that? I listen to everything uh, uh, that is uh, communicated from uh, this parliament, but we know uh, in the basis of the, you know, the, dev the devolution a um, settlement where, and we've had this discussion before, where the respective responsibilities lie. So whilst I will always listen to what's said uh, in this parliament, to the views of this parliament, you know, ultimately a, um, the responsibility uh, for the nature of these negotiations, as I think Mr. Monsieur, or Mr. Barney uh, confirmed to you, was, it was the UK government. Thank you. Rachel Hamilton. Good morning, Secretary of State. Um, are you happy with the current progress um, of negotiations, and do you think sufficient progress um, will be made before the um, next uh, meeting of the European Council in December? The, the, there's, um, you know, what, what's described as an EU task force, so um, which is in situ, and so that whilst there isn't the formal. Um, you know the formal negotiation process in this in this period. Negotiations, discussions are still ongoing. Of course, I'm not. You know, of course, we would have preferred that there was a decision um, in October uh, by the, the by the council to a, uh, proceed at that point uh, with discussions about the future relationship. That would, I think would have been preferable. But that was. That was not the decision. The decision was, however, to begin preparations for that, and that therefore indicates to me uh, and my colleagues in the government that we um, that we are in a position to uh, take that we should be in a position to take that forward uh, in December. But there is a huge amount of work to be done, uh, and uh, you know I'm I'm very very seized of the amount of work that's to be done, the amount of work that we'll need to do uh, with the Scottish government with with this parliament in relation to a lot of the um, statutory instruments and other uh, legislation that will require to come through parliament. So, I, um, you know, the, 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 uh, we go back to the, the clock is ticking and there's a lot to be done in a relatively short time. But I'm confident with the right um, spirit, right will, we'll be able to do it. Okay. I'd like to also ask you about the divorce um, settlement. Um, David Davis said that the withdrawal agreement will probably favour the EU in money terms, um, but a future relationship will favour both sides. Um, does this indicate that he is willing to be flexible in order to strike a deal? And has the Scottish Government made any comments regarding their views on the financial settlement? This is a negotiation, and in any negotiation, you know, financial arrangements are always... Uh, they're, they're, they're always Im important. Um, I mean, I think that we have made uh, what is a generous uh, offer in relation to 
I, uh, those financial arrangements. We're seeing through all our obligations in order to uh, um, that we have currently undertaken everything that countries could expect that the UK would be contributing to various um, arrangements, common agricultural policy and others. So I think that the financial arrangement we've put forward is uh, a generous but appropriate uh, one. But clearly, the financial arrangements negotiation has not been concluded and uh, therefore you know the government will have to have the flexibility uh, to continue uh, in negotiations uh, in that area is that something that the devolved administrations feed into within the um, jmc process well, the, the devolved administrations are able to feed in on any um issue or, or that they, that they um that they wish to do as i've said earlier i do very much welcome the fact and the constructive way in which the Scottish Government has approached the transitional period. That was something they wanted to see. It's something that's, that, you know, it's going to happen and we want a, uh, but, you know, it is, it is a basis on which a, um, we, uh, we would, uh, that we would, li we would listen to what was said in, in relation to, to any particular aspect. But ultimately, you know, as I said uh, to Mr. Greer, it is the responsibility of the UK government to conclude the negotiations. Okay, and finally, um, there's been much discussion today about whether there will be a deal or there won't be a deal and we'll fall to WTO rules. I wondered when uh, your recent visit to um, Sky, I wondered what um, was highlighted amongst the tourism businesses um, that you spoke to there, their, the opportunities that they felt from Brexit and perhaps the um, concerns that they had and, and what reassurance did you give them um, that businesses would have s certainty? Well, I have to say their biggest concern was that uh, uh, during the summer people had gone around saying that Sky was full uh, when uh, it wasn't and uh, they uh, wanted to make clear that uh, there was always opportunities for people to go um, go to, to uh, Sky. I mean, I think one, I mean, obviously one of the biggest issues that, that business uh, raises, and very, very, con tourism business raises, um, is the availability of seasonal workers. We're very, very, you know, seized of that um, issue, uh, and that will be a big part of, of the work, I hope, of the Migration Advisory uh, Council, certainly when I meet its chairman uh, later this month, I'll be stressing you know, the need not just in relation to the work they're doing in Scotland to, to, to be here in Edinburgh, but to get out uh, and about in and, and, and places like Sky. But overall, the, 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 end, the tourism industry there is uh, optimistic. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, Secretary of State. I've got one brief supplementary regarding your own line of questioning, Convener, uh, before I get into a couple of other questions. Uh, and that's regarding the, the vote that took place in the Commons uh, last night. Uh, and I've read reports this morning uh, uh, claiming that the Speaker Berkow uh, stated that the, uh, that the vote last night was binding. Uh, now, if that's the case, then can you tell the committee when these reports will actually be published? I have indicated what um, the government position is, which is to reflect on uh, the vote and to balance both um, the respect for the vote, but also the government's requirement to act in the, the national uh, interest. Okay, well, thank you. Um, in terms of the, the issue of the devolution and, uh, and 111 uh, perils has uh, been spoken about earlier and certainly the devolution is based upon the principle that everything is devolved uh, to the Scottish Parliament unless it's reserved to Westminster and earlier uh, this morning in your contribution uh, you spoke of uh, wanting to have a united and cohesive way going forward and also about the, about the parties coming together uh, as compared to having uh, one set of political objectives. Now with that being the case uh, there have been a number of amendments that have been placed uh, by uh, well, then uh, on the EU withdrawal bill, placed by both the Scottish and the uh, Welsh governments. Now, with that being the case, uh, if you if you want to have that united and uh, cohesive way going forward, uh, will the uh, will the UK government be accepting these amendments? What we've said in these, what we said, which we said at the the JMC was um, that we take the we, we take these amendments in the spirit that they were offered to be. Uh, helpful and to make a better uh, bill and we're in um, detailed discussions with both the Scottish government Welsh government on the nature of the amendments because th there are a number 
a number of amendments, um, and uh, we're reflecting on uh, what approach we will take to those um, those amendments. But we're, what I can reassure you, Mr. McMillan, is that we're taking them we take them you know take them seriously. There is you know there is a difference of of approach in terms of how a um, the respective governments think uh, that, that this um, process should proceed, but overall, you know, I, I, I think our general direction of travel is, is, is the same, and I, I hope that we will be able to reach agreement. Uh, certainly, and you've already, already said this morning too that uh, you'll always listen to the views of Parliament uh, of this Parliament, uh, but ultimately, it's up to the UK uh, government to take part in the discussions with also the EU. Um, but going back to that point of having a united and cohesive approach going forward, then surely not all the amendments uh, are going to be rejected. Uh, there will be amendments that the UK government can agree to, uh, to have that united and cohesive approach going forward. Well, I hope we can have, you know, I, I hope we can have a united and cohesive approach. It's in our best interests for everyone in Scotland, everyone uh, in the UK. The amendment, you know, the amendments to the withdrawal bill are part of that process. There are a number of other um, pieces of legislation that I've alluded to, and a number of other processes. But I feel strongly, you know, that we're in a better, you know, we are in a better. Uh, position uh, now in relation to being able to achieve that. I want to achieve that. I believe that, that the Scottish Government uh, are, are a, um, you know, seeking a constructive role. As I say, we're not going to agree on everything, but I think we're, you know, I think we're, we're recognising uh, together the scale of the challenge, and if we can proceed in that uh, cohesive way, then we'll get the best outcome. Uh, thank you. And my final question, uh, just that's regarding the, the meeting on Monday. Uh, it's already been touched upon earlier today regarding uh, agriculture. Uh, now, uh, there has been a £160 million shortfall uh, from the UK government to the Scottish government uh, regarding agricultural funding. Uh, so, and that's, already the, that's the situation now before, uh, before any type of uh, agreement or any type of framework is put in place regarding uh, agriculture going forward. So, uh, will that £160 million come, back, well, come to Scotland where it uh, should be coming to before any framework discussions are taking place, and will that be on the agenda on Monday? That uh, issue, um, the convergence issue, is you know, what you've set out is, is an opinion, not a fact. Uh, th this issue has been well uh, deba debated uh, and discussed, and I understand it was discussed in the Parliament uh, last week. Uh, as uh, you, you may have uh, seen, uh, Mr Gove is minded to uh, have uh, an independent uh, review in relation to a, um, this issue. But I would be very surprised if that issue was not discussed at that uh, meeting on Monday, because I think it has been discussed at every meeting uh, of that group uh, uh, in recent times. But will the money come to Scotland that Scotland is rightfully uh, due? You're setting out uh, you know, an opinion in relation to a uh, you know, in, in relation to a convergence funding. I would very much uh, welcome uh, the sort of independent review in relation to that issue, uh, which Mr. Gove has indicated uh, that he is minded to take forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Secretary of State, if I could just come back to our initial uh, line of questioning where we talked about uh, about your evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee where you clarified that you had uh, you had not in fact uh, been indicating that there was Scotland specific research uh, onto the impacts of Brexit, although that was the wide interpretation of what you said. Uh, just a few days after that, uh, Mr Davis was, was giving evidence to the Brexit Committee and uh, he, he was questioned on that as well. And he also seemed to confirm that there was Scotland-specific research and that it would be shared uh, with the Scottish Government. And he referenced your own uh, remarks to the Scottish Affairs Committee. So was he um, misinterpreted as well? I've, well, I've got, I've got in front of me the... the uh, the exchange that he had with uh, Ms. Cherry, and I, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't place your uh, interpretation on uh, uh, on those 
uh, remarks. I mean, essentially, he said that the matter had been discussed at the, the JMC. I, he he, he uh, that what I had said uh, would be uh, followed through on. I mean, that that that's how I that's how I read uh, uh, the, the the various in, uh, exchanges uh, um, there. What you said when Christine Jardin asked you, will it be shared between governments? And you said it will. And what I've what I've said just now is that officials are uh, are discussing a uh, sharing analysis. That, right. That's what. That's so, so you're you're saying that there's no Scotland specific, uh, there's no piece of Scotland specific analysis on the impact of Brexit. We now know that today. But we do know that there are this, these 58 sectoral analysis, yes. uh, some of which uh, entirely relate to devolved matters, such as uh, health and fisheries and agriculture, uh, education, higher education, very important sector. Will you be sharing them with the Scottish Government, as you had indicated we, previously? We, I want us to proceed on the basis of, of shared uh, analysis, a shared factual Basis. I, I think that that is. I think that that's the best way to proceed. But officials are in discussions about uh, the respective analysis because the Scottish government uh, uh, has carried out various analysis. I'm not aware, but I may be wrong, that they've published them. Maybe they. Maybe they have. Yeah, they uh, published them a few weeks ago. Well. They, uh, and they, they've shared them with yourself. So those fifty-eight pieces. Well, I, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not sure of the na that the nature. I'm, I'm not sure that that's a definitive um, statement in terms of all analysis. But I'll I'll check that out, and I will uh, I, I will respond. For, uh, I'll write yeah. to you uh, on the basis of uh, updating where officials are in terms of sharing analysis. And that is the, the specifically those fifty eight pieces of sectoral analysis. I'll, I'll write to you on where officials are in terms of the sharing of, of those 58 Right, pieces. but so far you can't confirm that they'll be shared with the Scottish Government. What I've, conf what I've confirmed is that the Scottish Government, UK Government officials are in discussions about these uh, analysis and I wish to, sh I wish to share the analysis and, and to have an analysis that we're, that we're agreed on. Right. We have a brief supplementary from Mary Gujon. Uh, thank you. In a response to Stuart McMillan's point about the the impact assessments, I mean, you talk about working on behalf of the UK, the national interest and the best interests of people here uh, in terms of trying to protect a, a negotiating position. But governments and parliaments across the UK are elected to represent the best interests of the citizens who elect them and all the citizens who live here. So surely it's within the best interests of all the citizens in this country and across all the nations of the UK to know how they, their lives, their businesses and the industries that they're involved in are going to be affected. In the best interest of the citizens of Scotland and the UK to get the best possible deal for Scotland and the UK in negotiations with the European Union. And it is not the best way to achieve uh, that outcome by sharing absolutely every piece of information that you have, not just with your own citizens, but with the people uh, that you're negotiating with. So you don't agree, then, that people should understand how this is going to impact their businesses and their lives? We had a referendum on whether we should remain in the EU. Those issues about how uh, leaving the EU uh, would impact on people were, were, the su were the subject of the discussion in uh, that referendum. When we get to an end point in relation to uh, uh, these negotiations, of course people uh, need to and un um, will understand what the implications are. But sharing all the analysis, all the facts, Every, you know, going naked into the negotiations with the 27 other countries will not achieve the best possible outcome for Scotland and but the rest of the UK. people were not given all the factual information at the time of the referendum. And for you to say that you don't agree that people well, should I, know how their lives well, are going to be impacted, to me, is quite frankly ridiculous. Well, I, 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 I'm sorry you, you feel that. You, you, like everybody in this room, had an opportunity to play a part in... Uh, the referendum. We're not rerunning 
that you, you know, we're not rerunning the referendum. The decision's been taken that the United Kingdom will leave the EU. We need to proceed to do that. We need to proceed to do that to get the, and get the best possible outcome. And that's what we're seeking. That is what we're seeking to do. Now, obviously, we're not in agreement on this uh, point. Uh, we've, we've heard that we had, uh, you know, about the parliamentary vote that took place uh, yesterday, the government's reflecting uh, on that uh, on that vote, and will uh, uh, you know, and will in due course set out how it intends to respond. Well, I have to. I just have to say that I think that the responses you've given today, though, give me absolutely no confidence that a good outcome will be achieved. And I do think people are entitled, and people have a right to know how this is going to impact their lives, and that information needs to be forthcoming. Well, we're just not going to agree on that, are we? And uh, we have gone slightly over no, time, no. so I would like to thank the Secretary of State for giving uh, his evidence to us today. And we shall now move into private session. Thank you.